All right, so now we're recording. So we're talking about the first article of the Apostles' Creed. Um, so first off, from your video watching experience, what can you tell me about the Apostles' Creed? It was created in about 300 plus. Okay. It's not in lieu of the Bible. It is um, a summary or recap of the most important parts of the Bible that we need to be able to understand. Okay. I'm through. But it basically summarizes the Christian faith, and it was written in ancient Rome. Hi, Maria. Hello. How are you tonight? I'm good. How are y'all? Good. Hello, Thanks Maria. For join us. Hi. So we're talking about the first article of the Apostles' Creed. Um, last week I sent out a video link for people to watch just to can kind of get an idea of the what we're talking about in the Apostles' Creed. Um, and so we're going to talk about the first article tonight. So. Like y'all said, it was written in the 300s. Um, this is about the time that Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, comes to power. Um, and you may or may not know this, but uh, so Christianity was not very popular within the Roman Empire as far as officially. Um, part of it had to do with the fact that we claim that Jesus is the Son of God. And that doesn't go over very well when the emperor claims to be the son of God. Um, tends to cause a, uh, a conflict of interest. Um, plus, Christians had this uh, opposition to go into the official emperor's temple and worshiping to the emperor because of the whole you'll have no other gods before me clause in the, the Ten Commandments that we discussed over the last couple months. So it wasn't exactly a very popular religion with the officials of the Roman Empire. Um, this changes with Constantine. Constantine is a, a guy who is trying to unite the Roman Empire, which is split into four parts for Tetrarch. It's called a Tetrarchy. Um, and so he tries to win a battle first. He does. And then he tries to take out all of his fellow co-emperors, which he does. Um, before his battle at uh, it's the Battle of Milvan Bridge. He has a vision um, of Jesus with a cross saying, in my name, you will conquer. And so he has all his men put crosses on their shields and on their battle gear, and they win the battle. So he uses Christianity to unite the kingdom, as it were, and it becomes the official religion eventually of Rome. Um, but Constantine didn't realize that he was getting into more than he bargained for because since the day after Jesus died, Christians have been arguing with each other over what to believe. Um, you can see this in the book of Acts. You know, in the book of Acts, you have to have the Jerusalem Council on at least two different occasions um, to deal with the mission to the Gentiles, which a lot of early Jews or early Christians didn't think should happen. Um, and also on Peter's declaration that unclean food was now clean based on his vision. So there's always been people arguing about what we should or should not believe. So Constantine demands that people come together and come up with a set of beliefs. People had already been trying to do that prior to this, and this is where the Apostles' Creed comes in. So... At its most basic level, this is just a, a short statement of faith, probably used by baptismal candidates to say what their understanding of the Bible was after all of the teachings they had gotten prior to baptism. Because in the early church, you didn't just get baptized normally, you went through catechesis and learned a whole bunch of stuff before you were baptized, and then even more before you were confirmed as a full member. Um, so this is probably just a, a baptismal statement of faith, which is why 
if you ever notice, we never use the Nicene Creed when we do a baptism. We never use the Nicene Creed when we do a remembrance of baptism or a confirmation because the Apostles' Creed is the baptismal creed. It also helps that it's really short and easy to memorize. And so it's easy to close your eyes and say it by memory and, and almost pray the Apostles' Creed. Um, so the first article is, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Okay, simple statement, right? How many of you remember when we transitioned from the green book, the LBW, to the ELW? Well, I remember when we did. I do. Do you remember that the creed changed when we did that? No. Hang on just a second. I'll show you. Okay, so the Apostles' Creed, as we currently say it in the ELW, let me get setting one where it's actually at, goes like this, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now here is the LBW version. So it starts off the same. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But then it changes when you get to the second article. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. The reason there was a change between the LBW and the ELW was because we, the ELCA, decided to go with a different um, translation of the original Greek. The version they went with is probably the better version. Um, because like one of the things that people got upset about was taking out the part where Jesus descends into hell. But if you remember, that's not actually in the Bible. It just says that Jesus died. Um, the idea of Jesus descending into hell was probably a mistranslation of the Greek, um, which just says he descended into Hades, which is the place of death. It does not mean hell. Um, this is not the first such change. The older version of our creed in the previous red hymnal, which was the service book and hymnal, the SBH, um, referred to Jesus coming back to judge the quick and the dead, um, which I kind of like that translation just because you don't call people quick anymore. But And that's what actually they taught us in, that's what, how I learned it in the Baptist church. He right. descended into hell, and then he will come to judge the quick and the dead. Yeah. Um, the Missouri Synod um, still uses kind of a version of that. Um, so at the beginning of the second article, instead of I believe in Jesus, it goes and, and I believe in Jesus. They, they change it up a little bit. Um, again, it's all different translations of the Greek because <laughs> – Having studied Greek for two years in seminary, I can promise you that there is no one way to translate Greek anything into English. It just, it doesn't happen. Hebrew is one thing. Greek is something completely different. Um, and Greek has so many different possibilities. That's why we have a, a dictionary called the BDAG that's close to 3,000 pages long that gives you different options for what a word can mean. 
in different circumstances. It's rough. Um, so all that is to say that while we continue to confess the Apostles' Creed as we have it, it's not necessarily um, word for word exactly what it was way back in the 300s when it was first written. Okay, It's changed a little bit over the years. As it's moved from one language to another, its understanding has changed. And so there's different versions out there. Just like John said, the Baptists have their version. The Missouri Synod has theirs. Um, if you look in the back of a United Methodist hymnal, there's like eight. Um, the, I, I'm not sure. I had to ask Mike, but I think they just pick one each Sunday. Um, it, it's, there's a lot out there. However, the good thing is that at least lots of us are using that creed in some form or another. Because even though the exact language may differ a little bit, the overall points remain the same. You know, the first article deals with God. The second article deals with Jesus. The third article deals with the Holy Spirit. And the reason the explanation of the Apostles' Creed follows the Ten Commandments in the small catechism is because the Ten Commandments set the ground rules for how we understand our faith. The Apostles' Creed lists what that faith is. So the first article, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, is directly related to the first commandment. You shall, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods before me. It's an acknowledgement that we have one God, that that God is the creator of the universe, of all things that are in it, that all things flow from God, and that we are a part of what God has made, and therefore not on our own, living our own lives, doing our own things. We're all part of God's plan and part of what God created. So I know some of you have this um, small catechism book. Others don't. Um, but if you look at the explanation that Luther has in the small catechism for the first article, Luther says, I believe that God has created me and all that exist. So there's your first commandment again. Um, he has given me and still preserves my body and soul with all of their powers. He provides me with food and clothing, home and family, daily work, and all I need from day to day. God also protects me in every danger and guards me from every evil. All this he does out of fatherly and divine goodness and mercy, though I do not deserve it. Therefore, I surely ought to thank and praise, serve, and obey him. This is most certainly true. Does that explanation raise any issues for you? The only thing that I think about that when I read that is I agree with all that he says, essentially, but I don't quite understand how he gets all of that out of the one sentence. Well, he gets all of that out of the one sentence based on his understanding first of what God has said in the Ten Commandments and then into this article. So if you have three, if you're going to have three basic sentences that describe what you believe as a Christian, then your explanation of what that first sentence, what God is, has to include everything that we know in the Bible about God. So he's not necessarily drawing everything there from, from that one sentence, but from the whole picture of Scripture. Does that make sense? I think so. That was sort of the way the Ten Commandments were done. They really expanded way beyond what the command was. Right. You know, it, it expanded more than just the simple... Yeah. Uh, the simple statement. What about this part where it says that 
God provides me with food and clothing, home and family, daily work, and all I need from day to day. God also protects me in every danger and guards me from every evil. Is there anything about that that bothers you? No, because there's other references in the Bible in regards to that. I mean, the one, especially about, do the birds worry about how they'll be fed? Why should you? Are you any less than these? Right. But there are also references to that. We'll have hard times. And there are times when those would be you're desperate for housing or whatever. You can take the the uh, Christ community veterans that are living in the wo woods. I think they would have great difficulty agreeing with that statement. Right. And see, that's, that's the thing that caught my attention too. So if you look in the large catechism, Luther has, a, has an explanation of that, you know, because even in his day, as really especially in his day, there were plenty of people who were dirt floor poor and, you know, weren't being taken care of. You know, they were starving to death. They were, they were wearing rags. Their kids were dying of strange illnesses that even back then they shouldn't have been dying of. You know, and, and what about these people? How do you tell them, oh, God loves you and protects you while they're dying in the street? So Luther's answer to that is that it's not just what God directly gives you. It's also what God equips others to help you with. So using the example of Christ's community, where they help, where we gather supplies to help the veterans in the woods, we are doing God's work we are using what God has given us to provide for the security and needs of those veterans in the woods because they can't get it themselves. So we are helping God in that mission. Where you run into a problem is where you take the stuff that God gives you and you hoard it for yourself and refuse to help others with it. Because when you do that, then you're saying this stuff is mine I have it and no one else can have it. And that's not what God intends for you to do with the stuff. Does that make sense? That, that sort of goes back to when we talked about the millionaire preachers. Right. Which I, I have a lot of difficulty with. So does that mean you're not going to be willing to help me buy a jet? When you get to be a millionaire, I'll decide. That's, that's very disappointing, Barbara. <laughs> well, folks, millionaires need preachers too. Yeah, yeah, they yes, do. But, but I don't see how a millionaire preacher is serving and helping the poor. I don't see how he got to be a millionaire. I'm thinking she'd be well cared for and live well and have vehicles to drive. I don't mean he should be poor, but he shouldn't be a millionaire if he's doing what I think the Bible tells him to do. That's my position. I mean, it's really only in the 20th century that we've come on to this idea of having a pastor who is only a pastor. You know, prior to the 20th century, in the, in the, in the 1800s, you know, even into the early 1900s, it was extremely common for a pastor to have a parish, but also have to work the fields during the week because they had to farm in order to make a living because your, your parish couldn't pay you that much. You know, bivocational pastors is a, is a, a normal thing. Um, and honestly, and I am a pastor saying this, the fact that a lot of that has gone away has, has led to us having troubles in the church um, because pastors can be expensive, but also because some pastors become entitled and we see that um, they forget that where their stuff comes from is from God and from God's people. And they tend to use it for their own gain rather than what they should be using it for. So, so in other words, you, t you thank God for your time with advance auto. Well, yeah. Because yeah. it's I mean, a lot of background and experience in 
dealing with the world and so yeah. on. And I mean, I, I think that if I had not been called to a, a two-point parish, which is essentially what we are at both Christ Community and, and St. Michael, that I would have ended up probably in something that would have required some amount of bivocationalism, just because I, I have always struggled with the idea of a full-time pastor kind of thing, where they only serve one church, even if the church is small. And I think a lot of that comes from watching pastors at my home church um, who essentially bled the churches dry um, because, you know, they wanted a pastor, but they couldn't afford it. So. so that's why at certain times you would tell us we were paying you too much for something. Yes. Well, you've been worth every penny. So there. Amen to that. I appreciate that. Amen. I'll second it. So, all right. So let's track back in a little bit on the, the first article here. Sorry about that. You're fine. It was my fault. I did it. Um, so one of the big things in this article that may be less of an issue with older people in the church, but is probably more of an issue with younger people is the idea of God as creator of the world. Um, I, I mentioned in a, I think it was an Advent, maybe a Lenten service, but it, it, I think it was an Advent service where I, I asked, you know, don't raise your hands, but how many of you actually believe that God created the earth in six literal days? Because honestly, that belief has gone by the wayside in a lot of Christianity. Um, science pushes back against that and says, there's no way this is possible. Um, where I fall on that is that, you know, one, we don't know what's possible for God. So we can't say yes or no. Two, we can have science and have science teach us all kinds of wonderful things without losing our faith. Um, regardless of how you fall on the idea of creationism, you can still look at the creation account and see the goodness in it, see the, the good news that God is proclaiming through it and how all things in creation are good and valuable and worthwhile. Um, so I don't think getting sidetracked into, you know, was it God or was it the Big Bang or evolution or what was it actually adds anything to this. But you can't ignore it either because when you ignore stuff like that, especially for younger people who are trying to come to faith, then it feels like a bunch of old religious fuddy duddies are trying to hide the truth from them. So how do you think if someone, a, a younger person asked you, you know, to address that, how do you think you would approach that? I have always approached it like, <clears throat> that God created the world. We can accept that. We don't have to know how he did it. Maybe he caused the Big Bang, or maybe he calls evolution. If those things happen, I don't think that that excludes God from being the creator. Yeah. I mean, I personally am perfectly okay with the idea of God's finger doing like this and suddenly the Big Bang happening. You know, I don't think that takes away from my faith. I saw when I was in undergrad, um, kind of firsthand, what happens when, when younger people struggle with this? Because I took a couple anthropology classes. They were, they were a required part of the, the history program. And so in anthropology, you're talking about all these, these ape skeletons and stuff that are discovered in Africa that walk upright and look a lot like us. You know, you know it's not just, not just an, an actual monkey. We're talking about different species like, was it? Australopithecus afarensis, which is a, it would look like us. And so if you don't have a firm basis where you can talk about, you know, how science interacts with God, 
then that kind of thing can destroy your faith and does for a lot of undergraduates because they get there and they can't understand, well, if this is true, how can what the Bible tells me is true be true? And how come my pastor or my church never talked about this? And so they feel lied to and they try to run away. You know, I hear a lot about how college is destroying faith. It's not that college is destroying faith. It's that we haven't done a good job of engaging with the world and the way it changes and talking people through these kinds of things. You know, we try to come down one side or the other and that doesn't work. We, ha we have to live in the gray area. Well, no, I mean, because actually, if you go back, the first article is creation. Okay, God created it all, so he created the science with it, even if we came from the big blue goo. I've not heard that particular creation theory, but <laughs> the big blue goo. Is that the same as the stork? <laughs> That's where the stork came from. The big blue goo. Yeah, first was the goo, and then the stork, and then... Pop, there goes an eight. So, all right. Um, well, another thing that uh, comes to me there, too, is the whole six days thing. I, I know that, you know, for us, a day is a, a finite 24 hours kind of thing, whereas God doesn't have limits of time any more than he has limits of dimension. So it is very possible that what he would have considered a day might have been eons to us. Yeah. So overall, as important as those issues are and as easy as it is to sidetrack into them, the goal of the small catechism is not to really go into that too in depth. It's to lift up certain universal truths that we can hold to regardless, whether we believe in one way or the other or something in between that's mixed together. So when Luther is explaining the first article, he talks about how the I believe is you, it's us. Okay? It's not it's not I as in this universal everybody. It's I, this is a personal statement of faith. Um, and because it's a personal statement of faith, you are personally describing what you know that God has done for you. Okay. Which is that one way or the other, God has created you. God has created you to be good. God has created you to be something that God loves. You know, that's, I struggle a lot when I see these people who are just screaming at each other on Facebook or wherever, because, you know, a lot of times we forget that everybody that we look at, whether we like them or not, whether we agree with them or not, they are somebody who is beloved by God. You know, and if they're beloved by God, they should be beloved by us. But even more than us and our personal statements, we're also talking about how God has not just created us, but everything about us. You know, we didn't bring ourselves to birth. We didn't. We didn't create ourselves. Okay? We didn't, you know, we can't take credit for, for most of what we are. You know, even what we eat, what we wear, the shelter we call home, you know, these are all combinations of things that have come to us in one way or another. Yes, through our efforts to some degree, but because God has ordained that we can have these things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So the maker, the giver of all these things is God. We know this from the Bible. We know this from our own lives. So God is the creator. God is also the father of all in that, you know, God has that disciplinarian role. God orders the heavens. God is in charge of all things. Again, this harkens back to the first commandment, you know, and especially where God says, I'm a jealous God. 
go. Um, so let's see. Um, how involved do you think God is with your life? I would say he's very involved. He knows the number of hairs on your head. I had a, a friend and I had said something that I had prayed about and she said, well, I don't think God's interested in those little muscute things. And it shocked me when she said that because I believe he knows what's going on in my life little and big yeah i don't know how he keeps up with it but he does i mean that's my opinion that's why you can pray to him you're supposed to pray all without ceasing which of course is not possible yes but theoretically you're supposed to be asking him about all aspects of your life as you go about your day and getting his advice on what you should do. And if that's true, then he knows what's going on in your life, whether you ask him or not. So there's an idea out there that, that maybe God just kind of set this thing in motion and then walked away and is off doing something else, maybe creating another galaxy somewhere else, far, far away, uh, Star Wars or something. I don't know. Okay. But if we hold to a biblical faith, a faith that the small catechism teaches us, a faith that is in line with the Ten Commandments and the first article of the Creed, then we accept the fact that God is involved, intimately involved in our lives. Okay? God is not just God the Creator. God is God the Father who cares about each of us because we are all part of his creation. Okay. God is not just some cosmic force that, that is an uncaring deity, because if, if God was, then why would we have had Jesus? You know, that wouldn't have made any sense at all. There would have been no intervention, and not just from Jesus. There would have been no intervention from the prophets. There would have been no intervention from people like Moses. You know? People would just exist, and prayer wouldn't mean anything. And obviously, that's not the witness that the Bible shows us. The Bible tells us that God listens to the needs of God's people, that God is involved with each of us. And just like John said, God knows the numbers of hairs on our head and everything about us. So we talked about one of the potential problems with this. Um, a few minutes ago about the idea of God providing for all needs. Um, Luther also points out the other, let's see. Um, so we talked about providing for needs, but Luther also points out, you know, if God really protects us from danger and evil, how can there be so much suffering in the world? Like Laura just now. Right. So, you know, if, if God's the omnipotent God who cares for all of us, why are people getting double whammed with two, tor or two hurricanes in a week's time? Why are, you know, people, and just look at Kenosha, Wisconsin, okay? You know, when the riot happened there last week, it started out as a protest for people who were demanding civil rights, and the riot broke out, and the people who ended up getting their businesses burned down were the people who were demanding for the civil rights because they burned down the black business district. So, you know, why is there that kind of suffering in the world? Why are there countries that have absolutely, you know, no chance of being anything better than, than what we identify as a third world country while we have people who have billions of dollars that they just sit on? And why are babies born with deformities? Right. You know, there's all kinds of suffering in the world. And if, if God really does care for us, then why are we going through this? Um, Luther understood that. 
You know, Luther himself lost a child. He actually wrote a, a, a book about it. And you can see that his theology kind of falls apart during the death of his daughter. You know, it, it kind of all gets sucked out of him because suddenly he's confronted with this very real situation that he doesn't have an answer for and he doesn't understand why it's happening. Um, so if you're interested in that, I can get you the name of it. It's, it's a good book. It's a sad book. But um, so Luther's point is that in and through all of anything, anything that we go through in life is not necessarily something caused by God because God's focus is always on life, okay? It's always on the creation being joyful and the creation being fruitful and, and good things for God's creation. Um, unfortunately, the reality is that bad does happen. Bad does exist. Sin does exist. And sin exasperates bad. Um, ultimately, God will make and sustain new life even from death. So even though we may suffer in this life, at the end of the day, we're still promised that we will come to new life with Jesus and that all things will be, all the burdens will be lifted from us and we will be new creations. And so, you know, I think going back to what Barbara said earlier about about God and what Bonnie was saying about how God's time is not like our time, you know, and this is, this is a Greek sidebar here, but so there's two forms of time in Greek. There's Kairos time, which is K-I-K-A-I-R-O-S. And there's Kronos time, which is C-H-R-O-N-O-S. Kronos is our time. It's, it's the time that we define as humans sun up, sun down, that kind of thing. Kairos time is God's time. And God's time doesn't subscribe to any of the physical rules that we have. So we may suffer in this life, but in God's time, good will win and God will re-edify, re That's not a word. Um, yeah. God will make it clear that goodness wins in the end and that God wants goodness for us. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. If I'm losing you, let me know. Cause it gets a little the you know, the 10 commandments were one thing. They, they were less theological and more kind of just laid out for it. The creed, because it's a statement of faith, it's deeply involved in theology. And so there's all kinds of rabbit holes you can end up in without even realizing it. So oh, if I get down a rabbit hole, say something. Yes. So when we begin our eternal life, all bad things will pass away and we will have goodness from then on. Yes. What about the people that that don't have eternal life. That's Say innocent question. people like the baby that's deformed and maybe dies as I, three months old. I don't think that God would ever look at a child that died and say, you don't get eternal life. Um, because that child is a creation of God. You know, they suffered because of the ills of the world, not because God was like, this will be cool, you know? So I don't think God's turning away babies because they didn't get a chance to do any of the things that show faith. Mm -hmm. um, I have disagreed in the past with some of my seminary classmates when I was in seminary. A lot of them have moved towards universalism, um, basically saying that everybody's saved no matter what. Um, they ground that in the idea that that God is so ingrained with love and so um, concerned for the creation that that a loving God could never send 
people away, no matter what they did. Um, I struggle with that because we've always said, even Jesus said when he was on earth, that there would be judgment. Um, I just don't know what that looks like. I, I don't know that there's some hell with the lake of fire where people who messed up are going to burn eternally. I hope not because, you know, I don't want to end up there. Um, but I think there is going to be, I mean, we know there's going to be judgment. It's, it's, it's even in the creed, you know, the last sentence of the second article is to come back and judge the living and the dead. But it's also that we, that we can only get to God through the son and, and accepting and having faith, which tells me that there can't be universal safety. I think where they, and like I said, this is them, not me. Um, where they, they argue there is that because not everyone has access to know Jesus Christ, um, you think of like the Aboriginal tribes in, in Australia that had no contact with, with outside people. And so, I think that's like the babies. Yeah. They haven't had an opportunity to know and that he um, would probably say that he'll take them with him. There's That's Linda. what I think. Hi, Linda. Hey, Linda. Hi, Linda. You been here all night? So, I, I, I think they also would say that, um, People who are Muslim or, or Jewish or something like that believe in the same God, but just different understanding. And I, I can't address that because I, 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 I don't have an answer for that. I have a problem for that because it, Jesus says you have to go through him. So that's why I have a problem with that. And, and I'm not 100% convinced that I'm right because of God's loving nature and they did believe in him, just not the whole Trinity. Yeah. So I don't know about that. So doesn't universalism seem to take away the need for Jesus? I think so. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I struggle with it. Um, I mean, if you read Paul, Paul comes close to universalism in several places. He never quite gets there, but he does come close to it. And that's, theologically, that's where a lot of this comes from, is taking Paul's arguments to the next level. Um, you know, you can also accuse Martin Luther of doing the same thing. Martin Luther essentially just kind of repeated Paul over and over again, but he went a different direction. And part of that was because the time he lived in, you know, in the time we live in, we seek to coexist with people of different faiths. Um, in the time that Luther lived, <laughs> they sought to kill people of different faiths. So, you know, it's slightly different, slightly different goals. Um, yeah. So, um, Did you notice in Luther's explanation that he reversed um, the ex the explanation? So he talks about God as creator before he gets around to talking about God as father. And we did the same thing. We just spent 40 some minutes talking about God as creator before we got around to God the Father. Why do you think that might be? Well, I think for me, it's because I think they're one and the same. Okay. 
Anybody else? I think, well, it could just be the fact that we're humans. And when you, when you think about God, you think about the creator. When you think about the father, you, a lot of people tend to think about their own dad. I mean, the figure itself. So, just like we talked earlier about how God's not some, some unattached deity who created the world and then ducked out and let whatever happened happen. Um, you know, if God had just done that, it might be sufficient to just say God is the creator. But we know that God did. So you need additional language in order to express the relationship that we have with God. Um, now, the, the default language of expressing that in Hebrew is masculine, which is where Father comes from. And where, you know, Jesus, when Jesus comes to earth, he comes as a male. So he comes as the son. Um, you can just as easily talk about God in a mothering sense. Jesus does actually do that when he talks about wishing to gather all of Israel under his wings as a mother hen guards her chicks. Um, so you don't need to get, don't, don't get too hung up on the, the gender specific relationship. Okay. Um, you can say God, the father, just as easily as you can say God, the mother, um, because I have a really hard time thinking that God has a gender like we do. Um, God is God and beyond description in every way, shape, or form. Um, but God does have that relationship with us that is more than just creator. God has a parental relationship with us, a relationship of love and caring that, that is intimately involved in our lives and is concerned for our well-being and wants to know that we recognize God as something greater than just somebody who put us here and left us to be. Okay. Which is why God covets our worship. You know, God wants us to be thankful. God wants to hear our thanks and praises, whatever, what is it? Jeremiah may have told the people that one time, you know, God cares about us and wants us to be in relationship with him. Um, this is even more clear. I mean, you, you see this in the relationship God has with the people of Israel. Okay. So God chooses Abraham. God promises Abraham that, that he will be a father of nations, that his descendants will number like the stars. Okay. And then later God essentially renews the covenant with Moses and leads the people out of Egypt and cares for them. And this is the whole story of Israel over and over and over again. No matter how many times they mess up, God comes back to them. God cares for them. God loves them because they're his people. Okay. And the culmination of that is in Jesus. Okay. We're all Gentiles, right? Nobody's a Jew here, correct? Correct. Okay. Correct. So... I may be named with a Jewish name. Joshua is a Jewish name. If you didn't know, it's in the Bible. Um, even has a book, but it's a good book too. Neither here nor there. Um, but I have no direct claim, at least as a people to, or as a person to say I'm God's people other than the fact that God created me. Except for through Jesus. Because through Jesus, we are adopted into that same covenantal relationship that Israel was. And so we have that same parental relationship with God. Does that make sense? Okay. So each relationship is established by God's unequivocal giving. Okay. It's not something that we seek out on our own because 
I'm trying not to get on the soapbox here. You hear people say they found Jesus. I really dislike that phrase. Jesus isn't hiding. Jesus doesn't need to be found. Okay, Jesus is there the whole time from beginning to end. Jesus was there before all time and all creation. So he's not under a rock waiting for you to lift it up and go, got him. It's not Waldo, it's Jesus. Okay. God seeks us out. God gives us opportunities to respond to him. Okay? It's not a matter of us going and finding anything. It's us responding to the opportunities that God gives us through the gifts that God gives us. That's where the, the God, the Father, really comes in. Okay? So, we believe in God, the Father Almighty, because God loves us and cares for us, and God has adopted us into a relationship through Jesus, just like God had established with the Israelites. And we believe in God, the creator, because God made everything and everything we have. And we don't actually own it. All this stuff is just on loan to us to be used for the greater good of God's people. That is the first article in a nutshell. What questions do you have about that? Ask him now, because it gets real complicated next week. <laughs> well, I don't want to say any more about millionaire evangelists, and you just restated that. Uh, I think the depth in which you're going into this is, is meaningful to me. And I don't think it, I know it, so there. A lot of this stuff I've never thought of, ever. Or maybe I forgot it. I'm so old I forgot it. That's probably what it is. The thing that, that frustrates me the most about theology, I'll be reading something from somebody who I will readily admit is far smarter than I am and has been doing this far longer than I have. And they'll say the simplest thing. And I'll just stare at it for 15 minutes, trying to figure out why I didn't think of that. Or if I had, why I forgot it and moved on from it. Because it's, it's these little things. Theology is like that. There's so many little tiny points, so many ways you can investigate things that it's not possible to keep it all in your head. You know? If you ever get a chance, go up to the seminary and look at the Lineberger Memorial Library. It's two floors, and they have over 100,000 books. And they're all dedicated to theology and research on the Bible and stuff like that. And they're always adding more books because there's so much to say about it. All right. Any final thoughts, questions, unresolved issues? Maria, I know you were... Go ahead. When we don't have anything else, um, the reason I was late was um, I got an emergency phone call. Um, my friend up in Minnesota, uh, uh, her daughter is, um, they found a tumor in her heart and she is probably, she is definitely having open heart surgery and possibly bypass surgery too. Um, and she's um, 47 um, and she has to go in for an angiogram the day after her husband starts radiation for cancer. And so she's just feeling really overwhelmed. Um, and I was just, I was trying to, um, you know, make her laugh, you know, try to, try to help her. And, um, and I would really appreciate putting Angie on our prayer list. Angie? Mm-hmm. Is that Angie. your friend or is that the daughter? The daughter is Angie. My friend is Jan. Her husband is Dan. 
whole family just she was she was jan jan j-a-n right jan and dan okay angie's husband has cancer what's his name jan's, jan's husband dan has cancer thank you yeah so it's just um but they're just feeling like like everything's just falling in on them all at once um so Well, you probably weren't here when we had this conversation about uh, God protects us and guards us in time of danger and keeps us safe and from evil. Bad things. Uh, he, he does, but sometimes not in the way that we think that he should or think that he will. Um, but whatever, whatever he does is right. And... Sometimes that's hard to live with. Well, part of what we came up with is when, when we move on to heaven, everything will be right. That's right. Did I do that good, Pastor? You did. Very good job. <laughs> I got one foot out the door. <laughs> <laughs> one foot out the door. Okay. That's right. <laughs> I've got that. Maria, I don't know if you've watched any of the videos on YouTube because um, we've been recording the other Bible studies. Um, but if you haven't, I hope this kind of made sense because it was a, you know, a, an interesting one to drop in on. Yeah, I have not seen those videos. Okay. If you go on to YouTube and search for, because it's still under St. Michael, we haven't changed the name yet. So if you search for St. Michael Lutheran Church, Monk's Corner, on YouTube, the channel's got all the, the videos on it, both worship service videos and also the um, Bible study videos. So you can go back and watch the ones on the commandments and stuff if you wanted to. Okay, great. Thank you. Yep. Um, eventually since we've got the partnership between Christ community and St. Michael now, and the partnership is called two rivers. Eventually I'm going to rename the channel two rivers, but every time I remember to do that, something happens. And so it just <laughs> had not gotten done yet. So. Pastor, would you be willing to do the prayer circle prayer next week? Sure. All right. Well, I'll put your name in the book. Here's a reminder. Your Sandy has a reminder. What's that, Sandy? <laughs> that her children love her. Oh. You all know my kids will not let that go. <laughs> That's good. They may not be here in, in, in body, but they are sure here in spirit. She reminds me, where's Lexi? She's over there on her tablet. Not, not going to say hello to us or goodbye or anything? Alexis. Alexis. Oh. Andy, that's one of your blessings. I went to go say, I went to call her and the Amazon thing spoke up and thought I was talking to her. <laughs> so. Yeah, that happened one night when Sandy said, Alexa, turn on the living room light. And our Alexa was like, what are you talking about? We don't have one. Yeah, ours sometimes does that during TV commercials. So. Hi, Lexi. Hi. Can you tell everybody good night? Good night. Good night, <laughs> Lexi. Was it was nice seeing you for a second there. Have you started back to school yet? Say no, ma'am. No, ma'am. We start on Friday for a half day. Oh, all right. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing, crazy pants? <laughs> so were you were you playing on your iPad? Yeah. What do you do on your iPad? Yeah. Tell her what you're doing there. I was playing Kiki and Piggy. You were doing what? Okay. All right. Well, why don't we go ahead and, and end here for the night? Because I, 
I don't know what she's babbling about. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <I'm> tired. <laughs> All right. Um, let's end with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Gracious, beautiful, and heavenly God, we thank you for the gifts you give us and for the ability to come together and study. We ask that you be with us as we continue to work our way through the small catechism, that you show us the things that you would have us learn so that we strengthen our faith and come to know more about you and the relationship you wish to have with us. As we leave this evening, we also keep all those who are suffering in any way in our prayers, all those who we've named in our prayer time, and also those who Linda has brought to us and let us know about. We ask that you be with all of them, that you give your love and peace to them, and that at the end, all things come to goodness. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 All right, y'all. I am stopping.